Some say it is the worst polluter in the state of Maine. For years, Lincoln Pulp and Paper Company has violated air, water, and land pollution standards, and it's been cited for more pollution violations than any other plant in the state. The mill still violates pollution laws, but it is allowed to keep operating. The reason is simple. The plant, which employs more than 600 people and pays half the taxes in the town of Lincoln, must stay open, or the town may die. I had uh, direct control over it. Yeah. I'd like to see zip pollution. Absolutely zero pollution. Jim King is a worker at the paper and pulp mill. The surrounding towns that rely on the mill for employment. And in turn, the merchants in town rely on us for our business. So it could be pretty devastating to the area if the state get very, very rigid and uh, Told, you know, said, you know, clean up your act within 90 days or else. By all standards, Lincoln is a one-mill town. Not unlike many towns in northern Maine, its livelihood depends on one industry. Because of the economic situation here, the state's Board of Environmental Protection has been allowing the mill to operate, even though it cannot meet pollution standards. The board has been trying to negotiate with the owners of the mill, trying to coax them into cleaning up at a pace the owners say they can afford. It's not an easy situation. And some say that until the mill does clean up, the residents of Lincoln will be subsidizing the operation with their health. Uh, how much longer does anyone get exposed to this before they get, like, cancer? Martha Benson is a resident of Lincoln. She doesn't work at the mill and is more vocal than most of the others in the town. They know it exists, but they also know full well that it holds their livelihood. So uh, they'd like to clean it up but they don't want to do it at the expense of shutting down the mill. And they all feel that they can uh, do better with pollution than they can without the mill. Some residents did complain, however, when this huge sawdust pile created behind the plant began blowing all over town. The sawdust pollution was so bad at these houses behind the plant that several families with children began legal action, claiming it was affecting their health. The company eventually agreed to relocate them. We asked the owners of the Lincoln Paper and Pulp Mill to talk about the mill on camera, but they have declined comment. However, the owners of the company state they inherited a massive environmental mess when they bought the mill in 1968, and that they have made progress in improving the situation. They claim that although they are personally committed to cleaning up the mill, the company has finite resources and can only do so much. But the questions regarding what the environmental and human health costs might be remain unanswered. No health studies have been done here, even though the mill is on record for emitting two and a half times the amount of air pollution considered safe for human health. We should do a better job in determining just what the uh, health problem is and go up and, you know, visit the hospital and talk to, talk to the people up there and do some uh, health statistics to determine just what the, the actual health imp impact is. Then we have something that we can balance against the jobs. As it is now, all we have all we have is the jobs. Claire Chesley is a staff member of Maine's Department of Environmental Protection. He points out that Lincoln Pulp and Paper Company is a subsidiary of the Massachusetts-based Preco Corporation. Chesley says very little is known about either company's true financial situation and that their assertions on what is available for environmental cleanup should not be taken at face value. We are allowing them to continue to contribute to these violations and contribute to health problems in Lincoln but we don't really know that they are moving as quickly as they can and are spending the money on solving the problems as quickly as they might. I think that Lincoln is struggling. Uh, I think that they are also trying to make a buck. They're trying to make money. And the slower that they have to fix things, the better chance they have for survival and the more money they w can make in the meantime. In the meantime, the air pollution problems will continue and people will, people's health will be impacted by the mill. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, they are doing, or they've told us they're doing everything they can to clean up their act. You know, when you get into a, a small town with a, one major industry in it, and it becomes a part of the fixture and people just, after all, accept it for what it is.
No one here feels that jobs and a healthy environment should be mutually exclusive. Unfortunately, the situation in Lincoln presents no easy solutions. For now, the mill will continue to operate, and the economy in Lincoln will be maintained. But many still question what the real public costs will be. They openly said it's, it's the, the, the town of the mill, so it's uh, let the mill run so the town can continue. But I think that uh, many people are afraid that by so doing that Boise Cascade and uh, anyone else uh, will ask for the same leniency. They have the same financial problems. And then if they are denied, well, look, you did it in Lincoln. This is a precedent. It's a precedent, I think, that uh, the, the total environment, the total main environment, will lose on. Yes, they're trying to break our union. They're trying to bust my life. Take all that I've worked for, for my kids and my wife. I was just getting where things were starting to go my way. And now these high price lawyers, these lousy scabs, trying to take my job away. Uh, at first, the community figured just another strike, but now they understand what's going on. The majority of them, they are on our side. I'm 52 years old now. I've been with the company for 25 years, three more year contract. I could have retired. They say we weren't the right to write that job, and I think we should have them. Pete Lucier has been a punch press operator for Sterling Radiator Company in Westfield since 1956. Last year, he and the other 67 union workers at the plant went out on strike when the company proposed 18 pages of cuts from their existing United Auto Workers contract. The strikers, most of whom have been with the company for more than 20 years, say they have been forced out by the company's owner, John Reed, a man they say they've helped to make rich. Well, he had 18 pages of takeaways, everything we've picked up in the last 24 years, seniority rights and everything. He had no choice but to walk out. Mm -hmm. I feel bitter. I've always busted my butt for that man, I really have. I've always given him a good day's work for a good day's pay, and I've always done it. I was never ashamed to take my check at one time. And I think it's a damn dirty trick he's pulled. Tensions mounted when four months into the strike, the company hired outside workers to replace the strikers. Since then, the company and the union have negotiated and agreed in principle on most of the original points of contention but they remain deadlocked over one key issue. While the strikers would like to return to work, the company refuses to rehire them. We ain't done with you Come yet, on, go buddy. over there and take our jobs. We ain't done with you help, that's all. As far as we're concerned, he hasn't negotiated with us. He hasn't tried to negotiate with us. You know, we've had a couple meetings and, um, you know, they just don't want to talk. They have no intention of talking to us. Well, I say it's got to be a straight unit bus. Westfield is a generally conservative community. They voted for Proposition 2 and a half, and in the 1976 presidential election, George Wallace got the most votes here. But the town's preference for conservatism has not stopped many of its 36,000 residents from openly supporting the strikers. Westfield Mayor Michael O'Connell. The uh, community has really taken the, the whole matter to heart. I think at first the, the people in Westfield believed that uh, it was just another labor problem at Sterling. I think the feeling now in the community is one in which the people would just like to see the, the matter end and uh, they'd like to see each party, each side, give way a little uh, so that these men can get back to these jobs that they've had for two and three decades in some cases. We've asked the management of the Sterling Radiator Company to talk with us on camera about the strike but despite several requests, they've declined comment. We did, however, obtain this videotape recorded in August of the only press conference owner John Reed has held since the strike began one year ago. The union's position was we had to take all the strikers back if we arrived at a contract. Our position was that we had given our word to the replacements that uh, uh, we would retain them. Uh, regardless of how we settle the contract. You feel like you're getting a raw deal? Absolutely. 
I'm hurt right down to the, the bottom of my soul, to put it blankly. I feel as if I've been, well, how will I say, uh, uh, punished for something that, severely punished for something I haven't done. And talking now, I feel very emotional about it. The replacement workers have been operating the plant now for nearly nine months. Many of them were as reluctant to talk to us as the Sterling management was. You want to talk to me? No, I don't. You know, when I came here, I didn't have a job, and I was unemployed. I had bills and mortgage coming up. And I got a job, and uh, I feel they should never went out on strike if they were worried that much. Oh, it's a good job. Why not? No, I don't. I think they wanted more than more than what they could have gotten. They were just being too greedy. They got what they deserved. These people are fighting for their jobs. You you may not understand well, we that, that, okay? We know well, that. Then what do you, how do you ask me for the what? The negotiation table is the way you take care well, of Well, I, I can't do that when the company takes the position that, that, that these people are going to be taking these people's jobs. The strike here has been an emotionally charged one. Five months after it began, union locals from throughout New England and other strike supporters attempted to non-violently block the Sterling replacement workers from going into the plant. Ninety-one people were arrested. I feel very, very badly for many of these people, particularly many of them that have over 20 years. They are, they are the real losers in this whole situation. I feel badly about it, but there's absolutely nothing I can do. You know, he says he's sorry about all this, and some guys that got all these years in here, I think he's full of beans myself, but he, um, he just wants a union out of there's the way I feel about it, and that's all written. It's all that's behind it. So the strike continues now in its second year, and it looks as though Sterling Radiator has chosen to stick with its commitment to the replacement workers, despite popular opinion. Some fear that the replacement workers will now file for decertification, and that would totally eliminate any union representation here. Meanwhile, strikers like Pete Lucier will try to hang on. When we got our union in, with the UAW by our side, we do that. You put your whole life into something, how the hell are you going to walk away from it just like that, you know? You just can't do it. At least I can. We all can stick together, we'll see a better day. This is Hancock County along the northern coast of Maine. In just two months, 95% of the United States wild blueberry crop will be blossoming in this region. That is, unless a destructive insect called the spanworm gets it first. Last year, farmers who grow these blueberries say they suffered $5 million in crop losses due to the spanworm. This year, they fear it may devastate the crop. We was hurt last year, I would say, maybe 50%. And uh, you take 50% of a crop, uh, it's a big bite. Tim Dickens grows 200 acres of blueberries on his family farm here in Maine. I hope we don't have the problem we did last year, but uh, we've always had some spanworm, but it seems to have multiplied. And uh, we've always had some damage, but, but for last year, for some reason, we, it, it really caused a lot of damage. And we are worried, blueberry growers are worried about the damage this year. The spanworm attacks the blueberry crop just at the time the plants are blossoming. Unfortunately, that's also the time that the bees are pollinating the plants. And without pollination, there can be no blueberries. There is one pesticide that can control the spanworm without harming the plants or the bees. It's called Dilox, and it could be the solution to the problem. But the farmers here in Maine may not be able to use Dilox because the only company that manufactures the pesticide won't sell it to them. The Mobay Chemical Corporation, makers of Dilox, refuses to sell it unless the Maine Pesticide Control Board, the regulatory agency for pesticide use in Maine, changes its position regarding Dilox. 
The board has ruled that although the pesticide is safe for consumers of blueberries and dissipates long before the crop is harvested, Dilox may cause genetic damage to humans during the spraying period. Pesticide Control Board member Dr. Frank Lawrence. And our uh, conclusion is that there is uh, mutagenic activity, at least at the bacterial level, and some suggestion of mutagenic activity on the part of Dilox in uh, laboratory animals and in human beings, although those studies are limited. And therefore, uh, we feel that the substance should be used uh, with caution and appropriate concern. The board will allow Dilox to be used this year under one condition, that sprayers tell their neighbors when they will use it and notify them that it may cause genetic damage to humans and other animals. It is this notification requirement that has caused the manufacturer of Dilox to balk. Mobe Chemical Corporation Vice President Robert Scott. It is the, the job of the uh, board to uh, register or not register pesticides in Maine, certainly, and they have chosen to do that except that they have really um, gone part way in this procedure and haven't quite said yes you can use it and no you can't use it and we, we feel that this is not quite the way that perhaps a situation should be handled. Uh, we're not aware of any problems with the use of Dilox in its wide variety of uses. So it seems to, to us that with the great volume of data we have and the great history of use that we have that Dilox is a very safe chemical. Despite pressure from the chemical company, the pesticide board has chosen to stand by its decision regarding spray notification. Robert Denny is the director of the Maine Pesticide Control Board. I think the state, uh, the state of Maine has uh, chosen a correct, cautious choice. The last word on Dilox hasn't been written or said yet. Uh, we feel that uh, we should have we should do everything within our power to avoid human exposure when there is a material that may be a problem. We've always notified our neighbors, uh, there might be a neighbor down the road that has a laundry out on the line. And uh, if we're going to spray, we, we let them know in plenty of time to take it in, you know. It's just a common courtesy type thing. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't bother me a bit to call them. The company doesn't want to put the restriction on it. I think they should. What I have to say doesn't make a bit of difference. But I'm speaking as a farmer who, if I had to, I probably would use it to save my crop if it was safe. And the, the restriction wouldn't bother me any. The controversy over Dilox stems primarily from a laboratory test known as the Ames test. Dilox has been shown to cause genetic mutations in bacteria used in the Ames test. Many feel it may cause similar damage to human genes. But the Mobe Chemical Company downplays the importance of the test says that the Federal Environmental Protection Agency has approved Dilox for use. EPA has done this. They have said, regardless of the Ames test, that Dilox is safe to use. We feel this should be sufficient for the state of Maine. But the Pesticide Control Board's Robert Denny is quick to point out that the EPA is currently reconsidering its registration of Dilox. It's being screened right now for some of the very things that uh, we found by the EPA. It's just a very slow process. But. At issue here is the question over who controls pesticide use in the state. The Pesticide Control Board has said it has set the most reasonable rules, but Mobe Chemical owns Dilox and says that Maine will have to play by Mobe's rules, or they won't play at all. There have been some, at least it seems, threats to not register the product if we stated what the facts were. I, I'm not sure that want to use the word blackmail, I would call it, uh, I guess, the usual jousting game that goes on between manufacturer of the substance and uh, those people who are uh, deciding what the appropriate regulations, restrictions, warnings, and information should be. At this point, neither the board nor the chemical company has plans to change their positions. In the meantime, Farmers like Tim Dickens will hope the problem is resolved before the span worm hits. As far as doing something about it, if we can find something that's safe and effective, we'll, we'll use it. But if not, we just won't. We'll just hope and pray we don't have extensive damage and harvest what we can. I feel 
feel that people have the right to choose as far as sex goes, what, how they want to handle it in their own life. And Kathy, not her real name, is a prostitute but she doesn't walk the streets of the combat zone in Boston or any other large city. Kathy works in Portland, Maine, a small city of 68,000. Despite these recessionary times, Portland is somehow experiencing a renaissance. Some fear that as the city develops, so will its problem with prostitution. As far as the kind of people that you can pick up out here for dates, it's um, just about anything. It's up to you what you choose to. Most of the girls that are on the street usually just go in a car somewhere and are, uh, are outside the car in the summertime, and they do their uh, counters at that point right then and there. Sergeant Frank Batchelder is a Portland patrol officer on the prostitution beat. It's always going on, and always will go on, prostitution. Most of them need money one way or another, either support a habit, uh, support their life, you know, just to be able to live. Uh, a lot of them are out there because they run into a guy who they they madly fall in love with and uh, he puts them out in the street and makes them work. In an attempt to curb prostitution here in Maine, the state legislature has passed a new bill. It's called the Act to Eliminate Discrimination in Cases of Prostitution. Nicknamed the John Bill, the law will make it a crime to be a customer of a prostitute. In the past, when a prostitute was arrested, her customer or her John was let go. But starting this summer, the Johns can be arrested and fined too, and their names may appear in the newspaper. Lieutenant John Brennan is a Portland police officer who has been studying the prostitution problem here for years. We need the John Bill to control prostitution, and we're convinced that once we can cut off the supply of customers, we'll have the most effective tool in controlling prostitution. But what's sad for us to consider is a man is also going to face a rather uh, tragic uh, home situation. John's start from the ages of, uh, say, 18, 19 to 55, 60-year-old guys. You're dealing with uh, people who are common laborers right up through the top of the bank executives. You know, most of them are pretty respectable people. Ninety percent of them are married, have families. Uh, that's embarrassing for them. You think that John Beale will really discourage men? Yeah. Not men from out of town. In the summer, I think there's still going to be a lot of it going on in the street because it'll be a lot of tourists. But as far as locally, you know, the men that live here don't want their name in the paper here. They're uh, definitely known prostitutes. The girl in the brown has been arrested a couple of times by my guys. That guy right up the street here, as you notice, the car going up the street is a uh, he definitely tried to check him out. This one here never moved, so he has to be looking. Police say they've had a hard time curbing prostitution here under existing laws. Often a prostitute will be back on the street working within hours after her arrest. Arrests are difficult to make, and attempts often fail, as did this one, the night we taped this report. Go right up to the deli, we'll pick him up right at the deli. Who is up there? What's the girl's name? Uh, she didn't give it to me. What's she look like? Hey, who is it? There she is. That's our girl. So that's one of them. Get the guy and we'll get him. Although right. prostitution is often called a victimless crime, many argue that the prostitutes themselves are the real victims. Many of them are teenage runaways caught up in a system of street prostitution for survival. It is hoped that the John Bill will scare off their customers and force the prostitutes into other lifestyles. The Portland YWCA's program for young street prostitutes is directed by Gloria Melnick. They are tremendously damaged kids who are out there and they're involved in a system that damages them more in an environment that damages them also. Any system that feeds off of damaged people um, and, and when we can exploit someone because they're damaged and they don't have that internal um, self-esteem that they need to say no to that or to look at other options or to do something more positive with their, their lives, then I think they're a victim. And so I'm hoping that um, the, the client market will drop off for these kids. And so then they will be forced into looking at other alternatives, uh, that that will not be one of the survival options available to them on the streets. So there's a lot of young girls that work around here, and that's the only thing I do agree with about the law. I think it will keep a lot of the young girls off the street because I don't think 14 and 15 year old old enough to make up their own mind to know they want to go out and, you know, 
it seems to all go in the pimp's pocket and I don't. And by doing that, um, I think we say that, that there's something wrong going on here and somebody needs to be responsible for it. We wouldn't have the young kids, we wouldn't have the 20 year olds out there doing it. We wouldn't have the guys who are the 21 year old pimps. The nuclear genie has been out of the bottle for over 35 years. The baby boom generation grew up in the shadow of the mushroom cloud, practicing how to duck and cover in the event of the unthinkable. You duck and cover tight. Duck and cover under the table. It's a bomb. Duck and cover. It is difficult to imagine a nuclear holocaust. Most of us have adjusted to life in the nuclear age by not dwelling upon it. But over the years, the weapons have become more sophisticated, more accurate, more destructive, and more frightening. The anti-nuclear movement started in Western Europe, where people are fearful that they may be the first targets in a nuclear war. The movement spread to the United States and galvanized around the idea of a nuclear weapons freeze. It was a basic, understandable concept, a proposal that lifted the mind-boggling nuclear debate out of the complexities of the SALT talks. It gave citizens a feeling that they could participate in a process dominated by political leaders, generals, and scientists. How about you? Send a postcard to Congress supporting four. nuclear weapons support. freeze. Would you like change nuclear back? Weapons. No, we're going to take four. The freeze movement started right here in Massachusetts. Randall Forsberg of the Institute for Defense and Disarmament Studies in Brookline coined the term and was the first to originate the idea of a verifiable freeze on the production and deployment of all nuclear weapons. If this campaign keeps growing in the way that it has been growing for the last six months, the people of the United States will have the power to force the government to accept the freeze. What we needed in order to stop the nuclear arms race was a constructive proposal, so it wasn't all doom and gloom. Something that people could say, hey, that would be realistic, that's possible, that's a good idea, maybe that's worth working for. The power and intensity of the freeze movement has seemed to take the government by surprise. Last September, Wisconsin voters approved a nuclear freeze referendum by a three to one margin. And in November, voters in seven more states, including Massachusetts and Rhode Island, passed their own nuclear freeze referendums. So did the District of Columbia, although the freeze referendum in Arizona was defeated. But it's the resolution debated yesterday in the U.S. House of Representatives that the freeze movement hopes will give it its most substantial victory. Though a vote was not taken yesterday, the resolution is expected to pass easily next week. It has not been an easy accomplishment for supporters of the nuclear freeze. Last year, a similar resolution was defeated in the House by only two votes. Even if the new version does pass next week, it won't be binding on President Reagan and his arms negotiators. But free supporters hope it will send a clear message to the president that it is time to halt the development of new weapons as a first step toward an arms reduction. A freeze simply isn't good enough because it doesn't go far enough. We must go beyond a freeze. The Reagan administration is adamantly opposed to the freeze, saying its supporters are ill-informed and the proposal would be disadvantageous to national security. Reagan and Freeze opponents say the Soviet Union has a significant edge in nuclear arms and that to freeze now would give the Soviets the advantage, undercutting deterrence. But Freeze supporters say that politicians are out of touch on the nuclear issue and that it's time for Washington to wake up to the concerns of the American people. The Freeze Movement is now considering a massive national petition drive to appeal to Congress to stop funding nuclear weapons projects. And in the Senate, a freeze resolution sponsored by Senator Kennedy and Oregon's Mark Hatfield is expected to...